Hi, good morning. My name is Stephanie Grokey, and I'm just beginning my second year as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Mineral Sciences. And I'm here today to talk to you about the magma storage conditions that precede the largest volcanic eruptions on Earth. And so these eruptions have the potential to have global effects. So for example, these eruptions have the potential to induce global climate change, cause mass extinctions, and devastate both the lives and the infrastructure on a continental-wide scale. And so this image here is an image that I took of one of these volcanic deposits. It ranges from 25 kilometers to 10 kilometers wide. So just imagine this amount of material raining down on you, actually blanketing the landscape and producing ash that reaches the stratosphere. And so in attempting to understand what drives these systems to erupt, I'm particularly interested in the magmas and the magmas that are stored immediately before they get erupted. And so we often, or always actually, find these systems on continents. And so I'm going to take you to a journey to northwest Argentina, where not only do we have the thickest continental crust, but we also find many of these large volcanic systems. So I've been able to do multiple excursions to the Cerro Galán caldera, located in northwest Argentina. And here is an aerial photograph of that caldera with uh, color relating to topography or elevation. And in this case, the eruption that produced this caldera was 2,000 times the size of the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. And when this large amount of magma gets erupted rapidly in an explosive eruption, it actually creates a hole in the Earth's surface, and that's what we're seeing here. And in the case of the Cerro Galán caldera, it formed this ellipsoidal shape. And to just give you an idea of how big this caldera actually is, I'm going to overlay a district that you're all very familiar with, uh, Washington, D.C. And so if we remove this, this map, we see that the whole extent of Washington, D.C. can fit within this caldera. So if we look at this from another view, we can look at an oblique angle. And what we see in the center of this hole in the ground is this central dome that's actually a baby volcano rising in this larger caldera system. And just to the north are these young lavas. And these lavas erupted at the same time as this baby volcano grew. So the question that's really driving my research is where did the magmas reside that erupted to form those young lavas? Were they extremely deep in the continental crust, tens of kilometers? Or were they just residing a few kilometers under our feet? So in February, I went to Cerro Galán to collect samples. And this is an image of me standing at the southern edge of the caldera, looking to the north at that baby volcano that's risen 18,000 feet above the Earth's surface. And so as we do our field work, we collect samples. And in this case, the lavas that we collected have four mineral phases. They have plagioclase, sanidine, quartz, and biotite. And so we're going to combine these efforts that we do in the field with experimental petrology. And here's an image of our cold sea laboratory up in the mineral sciences department. And these are four different furnaces. And so we take that rock we collected from the field, we put it into a tiny gold capsule, there's a pen cap for scale, and we insert that capsule into these four furnaces. We use water as a pressurizing medium and ramp up the temperature and pressure of these capsules to simulate magmatic conditions. And so from those lavas that we collect in the field, we can already generate some constraints. And so some minerals can just give us temperature. And so in the case of Cerro Galán, the magmas resided at around 815 degrees Celsius. So we're going to run our experiments across that temperature ranging from 700 to 900 degrees, which is relatively cool for magmas, but much hotter than any toaster oven can go. And then we're going to use experiments to constrain our pressures. And so we as geologists uh, look across a range of pressures, in this case from zero, which represents surface, to around 250 megapascals. And this relates to depth. So there I have a dog sitting on the surface. And as you increase the pressure, you're going down into the Earth. So you're increasing depth. And so we've run numerous experiments at various temperature pressure conditions. And so if we take this experiment, for example, we increase the temperature of this experiment to 800 degrees, pressurized it to 75 megapascals. And then we cooled it incredibly quickly so that the rock that's left in that experiment retains the conditions of a magma that would have resided at that pressure and temperature. 
Then we look at each of these experiments in detail and see what mineral phases were stable in each of them. And so those experiments that lie below this line have sanidine. Those that lie below this line have quartz. Above this line have biotite. And below this line have plagioclase. And now what we're interested in is where does our natural lava fall on this phase diagram? So we need all four mineral phases to be stable. And we also need to be at a temperature of 815 degrees. And so with that, we can pinpoint the magmas that erupted to form these lavas in pressure or temperature space. And in this case, they resided just below our feet at less than four kilometers depth. And so what the implications of this is, is that these magmas rose to extremely shallow depths, just a few kilometers below our feet, before this volcano erupted its last gasp and extruded these really young lavas. So with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. This is for Stephanie. Um, I'm just wondering, okay, so is Cerro Galan, is there any part of it that is actually active or dormant, first of all? Uh, or are you collecting relatively fresh lava samples to compare to the ones you're collecting from Cerro Galan just to have that kind of like, I don't know, an active lava baseline, something like that? Um, right, yeah. Thought. So Cerro Galan was last active two million years ago. Okay. And so the catastrophic eruption that formed the hole in the ground um, occurred first, and then right. immediately after that, those young, younger lavas were then extruded, and those are the ones that I sampled and spoke about today. Okay. Uh, Cerro Galan still has some active hydrothermal activity there, so there still seems to be something hot underneath the surface. Um, but in terms of other work we're doing, we are combining our work with from these dormant or less active systems with more active systems that are occurring, say, in Central America, for right. example, to see what those are doing as well. Not right. at the same scale as these, right. much, much smaller volcanoes. Right. Easier. Don't be worried. Yeah. <laughs> Question for Stephanie. Can you say a little bit more about the formation of the original caldera there and how deep the magma chamber might have been for that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so part of our work has also been to constrain exactly that where the magmatic system resided that produced that hole or that caldera. And that was likely deeper, so closer to eight to 10 kilometers in depth. And so what we can say is that as the system has evolved through time, it's shallowed, shallowed with time. 